Welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Today we present British Liberian artist and gold gilder, uh, Lena Iris Victor. A big thank you to our partner today uh, for their support. Uh, dear partner to us, uh, University of Michigan Museum of Art, uh, or UMA. Uh, they have been a partner long time with the series. We have many exciting upcoming projects that you'll hear more about. Um, so make sure to go off into the museum. Uh, they're a great resource in our community. Uh, this is our last event of our fall season, believe it or not. Uh, but never fear, we will recommence uh, with the winter season on January the 17th. And our first event will be another uh, co-presented event with UMA. We will present curator Eva Respini, uh, who is the curator of an exhibition called Art in the Age of the Internet. 1989 to today, and this exhibition is going to open at UMA on December the 15th, so you get a chance to go and see the show before we reconvene in the new year. Uh, I did put out some new season sneak preview flyers on the little table in the outer lobby, so you should take one on the way out. Uh, there's more to come. We're hard at work uh, finalizing details for a few additional events, but this will give you a taste of what is to come as we continue with part two of season turn uh, and looking forward to seeing all of you back in the new year. Uh, today out in the lobby, we have with us SAPAC, Sexual Assault Present Prevention and Awareness uh, Center. Uh, there's some gals out there with some fun stickers and information for you, so drop by and say hello. Uh, one announcement, join us tomorrow and Saturday for the opening weekend events of the undergraduate juried exhibition at the Stamps Gallery. This exhibition provides an opportunity for the school to support students whose creative work is recognized as exceptional uh, by invited jurors who have thousands of dollars in awards to give. And these awards will be announced at the opening reception tomorrow from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock at the Stamps Gallery. And then on Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m., you can join the exhibition jurors and students for an exhibition walkthrough where the jurors will share how and why they selected the award-winning artworks. Uh, we will have our regular Q&A today in the screening room, so pre please join us directly following the talk here uh, and uh, come and meet Lena and ask her some questions. And by the way, thanks to everyone who braved the nasty weather today. Um, it's not so fun out there, but it's really warm in here. So please remember to silence your cell phones. Uh, and now for a proper introduction of our guest today, I'm very honored to introduce you to a noteworthy newcomer to campus and of particular significance to our speaker, the newly appointed Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs and Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at Uma, Vera Grant, has recently landed with us here in Ann Arbor uh, from the Cooper Gallery at Harvard University, where serendipitously, she gave Lena Iris Victor her first significant institutional show. So please welcome Vera Grant. Hello and good evening. Hello and good evening. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just really, it's a, it is serendipity that just at the time that I was moving here, uh, Lena tells me she was going to be here giving the lecture. Um, it's just one of those um, wonderful moments in life and I have been just um, experiencing wonderful moments all over the place by coming to Ann Arbor, so I'm quite delighted. I have worked with Lena um, for the past uh, few years, and it's been a wonderful, very special experience that spills over from being colleagues right into a sisterhood. It's very unique and vibrant, and I hope that when you uh, listen to what Lena has to say and see some of her art, that you would see how that would be an illuminating and extraordinary experience. So Lena Iris Victor is a conceptual and performance artist and painter living between London and New York. And the multidisciplinary approach to her work, 
We use disparate materials and methods belonging both to contemporary and ancient art forms while calling into question the nature of time and being. Her works are emerging of photography, performance, and abstract painting, along with the ancient practice of gilding with 24 karat gold. This cross-pollination of genres unite to create increasingly dark canvases embedded with layers of light in the form of symbols and intricate patterns that Victor calls light works. Victor has exhibited in museums in the United States and abroad, most notably at the Harvard Art Museums and the Cooper Gallery at Harvard University, the Spelman Museum of Fine Art um, at Spelman College in Atlanta, and she's also engaged in numerous critical talks and panels at New York University, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, St. Louis Art Museums and Kunz College in London. I've seen her and met with her at numerous fairs. It is really wonderful that the Stamp School of Art has, you know, gone out of their way to present the talk this evening by Lena Victor. Her work transcends mysticism in a post-colonial spectrum, and in doing so, she reenacts a disruptive idea of primitivism. Her interpretations reveal intelligence, beauty, and perfection. Yet trapped in refuge and confinement, her reflections of postmodernist societies seem dark and threatened. By blackening her naked body, she inverts European notions of beauty and purity. Victor poses with defiance. Her use of gold on and around the black body reminds the viewer that she acknowledges light because of the existence of dark. One begins where the other ends. And centering the black female body alludes to women's mysteries of African matriarchal collectives and the preeminent roles women played within these collectives as a harmonizing enforcer of justice. Victor's narrative poses a concept of utopian threat, where women reign supreme as arbiters of justice, the aesthetic ideal, and the divinity we all look to, to reestablish balance in the world. And her utopian decor contradicts values incarnated in a society that has long lost or is trying in earnest to regain its values through spiritual introspection. So Victor layers her body on top of the canvases and gold on top of her body, such that the imaginary becomes secondary. And her works recall the realm of adornment that once existed preeminently. So far, her intuitive introspections reveal a collective memory. Meticulous and mysterious, her works are an entreaty to the divinities. Each portrait is gilded, adorned, and blessed with her own hands as a personal and intimate offering. So using symbolic characters, this artist spreads a light that invokes the desire to collaborate the inner substance of life, to celebrate it, but she also excavates the essence of wealth from under earth, oil and gold. Please give a warm welcome to Lena Irish Victor. Hi, hi guys. Um, firstly, I want to say thank you so much for all of you to come, coming out tonight and braving this uh, crazy weather. Um, this is my first time to Ann Arbor, to University of Michigan, to Detroit. I can't say the weather is that different from New York right now, so it's not that much of a transition. But, um, but yeah, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to giving you this talk tonight. I wanted to make it as informal and natural as possible. Um, firstly, I want to thank Christina for inviting me here, and uh, Ati as well, who I know is a former, he, he was a lecturer here as well, a good friend of mine, South African artist, who also referred me. So thank you to Ati, even though he's not here. And um, to Vera as well, because like she said, we really have formed 
something of a sisterhood in the last five years I've known, we've known each other. And uh, she's become a mentor for me, a kind of surrogate mother for me, a, gu a guide. And I have the utmost respect and love for her. So I'm so happy she could open this for me tonight. Um, I call this talk Materia Prima. Materia Prima um, is a name of a lot of my works. And it is a Latin term. It means first matter, almost like primordial matter. Um, it's an alchemic term. And what it means is the kind of innocuous material or this kind of primordial material that is involved in the, in the creation of the magnum opus, the great work, if you will. And it is the, the material that is used to create or in search of the philosopher's stone, the proverbial philosopher's stone. I think that all artists, in a way, have to deal with this idea of, of creating from nothing, of creating out of this kind of space where uh, it's nebulous, and yet from that is birthed greatness or you know, the work that you do. And I think that every artist is always in search of the idea of creating the magnum opus, the great work. I first wanted to start with this, this um, quote from Martha Graham. I'll read it to you and, and you can read it as well but it's a very important quote that has kind of affected my career a lot throughout um, since I started as an artist. She says, there is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all of time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and it will be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable, valuable, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. You do, not, you do not even have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep yourself open and aware to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. This is a quote she said to a good friend of hers, Agnes DeMille, when she had, um, won all these awards for the play Oklahoma in 1943, but she didn't feel like it was her great work. And she was kind of upset that people were giving her all these praises when she had other work she wanted to be respected. I, as an artist, am always striving to keep that channel open, to keep those conversations going with the other dimensions, if you will. I feel like artists are conduits. Um, they are conduits between worlds, and they are supposed to reveal that which is hidden to other people. They're meant to be seers, shamans, whatever you want to call it. I thought the best way to start this, because many people may know me in this room and many people may not know me, um, is to start at the beginning because I've never really spoken. There's a lot of things swirling about in the media about my, myself in the last couple of months, but I've never really spoken about my path, how I got here. I've been practicing as an artist for only five years as a visual artist. I began my practice with the first painting I ever made in 2013. I did a lot of things before that. So I said I'll start at the beginning in my, when I grew up in London. My parents um, are both Liberian, born and raised in Monrovia. And my dad was educated in the States, but went back to Monrovia to begin his business, married my mom, quick story, the quick version, married my mom and had my eldest sister right there, Michelle. She um, and my family had to flee in 1980 when the first coup uh, broke out in Liberia and Monrovia. They fleed in this kind of reverse migration, if you will, to Virginia. My dad took all of his external family and they all left and went to Virginia. Um, if you know anything about Liberian history, which I will tell, talk more about in the future of this talk because of the show I have right now at New Orleans Museum of Art, but Liberia was founded by the American Colonization Society in 1822 as a free haven, Africa's first republic um, for free-born and recently emancipated slaves, African-Americans. So they went, made that journey over decades, starting in 1822. And because America had almost been the seeding ground for this, this uh, idea of a nation, when everything went to pot in 1980, a lot of them returned, or the people that were the, the kin of those that first went returned back to America. That was me in, at four years old. And um, I went to school in London at this, at this uh, school, elementary school, that was 
British, by all intents and purposes, but very Scottish. And uh, we had the whole regalia. We had to wear the kilts and the sporrans and the fawn socks and the shoes and everything and the blazers. It was all about pomp and circumstance, like so much of Britain kind of uh, Britain is. And it was a good time, um, but that was where I got bit by the bug. And the bug was the performance bug. And I did my first play there. I played Merlin in um, Arthur and the Round Table, or whatever it's called. And I realized that this is something I really wanted to do with my life. I wanted to perform. I wanted to be on stage, kind of like this. But this is actually very uncomfortable right now. So. <laughs> um, this is the school I went to after uh, Marymount. I later found out from my friend this week that Marymount there's a Marymount in California, which Kim Kardashian went to, too. I don't know what that means, but, um, but I went to Marymount in London. And this is kind of a smattering of pictures from that time. That's our graduation. And I went to an international school, so it was a very rare kind of experience. There were about 200 girls, and um, there were about 25 nationalities represented. So I grew up in this microcosm, very false idea of the world, where I had Arab friends, and I had Mexican friends, and Italian friends, and, and you know, Taiwanese friends, and, and we all lived together happily, and we, you know, I was in boarding school, so we literally became family. I learned a lot in that time. I learned about worldliness. I learned about acceptance. I learned about what it means to have to um, engage with other cultures. I would practice Ramadan and Eid. I would uh, also go to Catholic service, even though I wasn't Catholic. Uh, I would travel with these people. We'd go to Greece. We'd go to you know, different places. We did model the United Nations together in The Hague. It was an amazing experience. It taught me how to have a different perspective about the world around me. Very unnatural perspective once I left, I realized. So what happened was I started to gain my confidence. Um, I went to, I auditioned for a few plays. I, I got in sixth grade and seventh grade some bit roles I wasn't very happy with. And finally, I was determined. I was like, this is going to be my path. I love doing this. I'm going to get my confidence together. And I'm going to be able to inhabit these characters, these people. So I started to, when I started auditioning by ninth grade, I started to get the, the lead roles. I played all kinds of characters. That's me playing Sky Masterson from Guys and Dolls. I played Sally Bowles from Cabaret. Um, a lot of these are Cabaret. I played all kinds of roles, Mercy Lewis in The Crucible. And um, it really did teach me that acting, once you are comfortable in that space, you can really fulfill any role. You can be anyone. And I love that experience. So obviously, the natural step afterwards when I graduated was to pursue my theater you know, studies. And I was coming to, the school, to school in the States, to college, because all of my family went to school for college in the States, uh, college. So I went to Sarah Lawrence, which maybe wasn't the best idea in retrospect, but um, taught me a lot. And I got there to practice theater, primarily. And um, what I experienced was amazing practitioners, amazing teachers, couldn't, couldn't compare. And I got class A education. But however, whenever it came time for me to actually audition for the plays the school was doing, I always found myself getting typecasted. And after this experience, you can understand why I found that troublesome. I was always typecasted, obviously, because of my blackness, because of my race. I quickly made the decision at the ripe young age of 18 that this was not going to be my path. Because the one thing I cannot abide by is someone trying to put me in a box. So I decided that even though this is something I love, it's something that I can return to in time. But it was not something that I needed to do right now because, as you can see from you know, some of the most A-list uh, you know, actresses, black actresses, they still have trouble with this, the imbalances of the industry. It usually is a political thing that kind of de detracts from, pe from people from the work they want to do. And so I decided that it was time for me to find something else to do. So I decided to switch my whole major to film. Sarah Lawrence didn't have majors, but I did a whole kind of smattering of classes in film. I did everything from narrative filmmaking to documentary filmmaking to um, I did screenwriting, editing, 
everything. I really tried everything. And there was one class that I did that was very, very uh, impactful for me, and that was when I took The Art of Film with the late, great Gilberto Perez. And he taught me and opened up a whole new vista into what um, I could see myself doing if I were no longer in front of the stage but behind the camera. And I would watch films like L'Aventura by Michelangelo Antonioni and see the implicit um, framing of the works and see how, how these, these characters interplayed with each other in such a romantic way. And I never, I never saw films like this before. You know, we grew up in a time where the majority of us, if you don't take a film class, you, take, you see the Hollywood films, the blockbusters, and yes, now more art films and independent films come through, but these are the auteurs. These are the creators of the genre. I learned about Blow Up. I love this film. I learned about the figure, and I learned about composition, and the fact that you could even do something like merge fashion and, and merge all kinds of other disciplines into one in a film and make the art direction so strong. And actually, the characters aren't even that strong, but the, 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 the whole infrastructure, the world that was created, was so potent. I learned about Ingmar Bergman, Swedish film director. This is a scene from Cries and Whispers. I honestly can't even remember what this film's about, except for it's an all-female cast. And look at this image. I mean, it really moved me that you could envision a set that, had, that didn't have to kind of conform to reality. It could be someone else's illusion or someone else's idea of a hyper-reality, of a, a vision where color is actually the signifier in the piece rather than the actual actors, per se, and they all work in tandem. More scenes from Cries and Whispers. I learned about Carl Dreyer. This film really revolutionized things for me, um, The Passion of Joan of Arc. We watched this film, and the technician who put the film on made a mistake. It's a silent film, but there's a score, and she forgot to put the score on. So we watched this very traumatic film in complete silence for two hours. And this film, if anyone has seen it, is a series of super close-ups. Everything's in close-up and panning shots, but no really long shots, no, really t no, no time to take in the rest of the space, so it feels very claustrophobic. And you feel the traumas of this character who played, this actress who played Joan of Arc. And she apparently, a little bit of trivia, never worked again. This was the first film she made and the last film she made because she was so traumatized by playing this role. You see how the close-ups are. This is the entire film for two hours. It's very intense. But it, sh it shows you what the power of, of the creator to, to, to shake the very kind of emotional ground you stand on when you're watching something, to evoke something that is, that is most of the time very hard to evoke or pull out from people. I learned about Usman Semben, Senegalese, father of Af Af the father of African film, they call him. And he said something very important that I always refer to in my work, which is the fact that if we as Africans do not tell our own stories, Africa will soon disappear. And that's a very real statement because our stories have usually been written by other people for a very long time. I feel that my mandate, I feel that it's very important as an artist that I tell our stories. I learned about his film Black Girl, beautiful film, and he in this film is telling a story, a very common story, a black Senegalese girl looking for another way out, looking for a... Um, an opportunity to, to you know, increase her, her kind of livelihood. And so she takes a job with a French family and realizes that it's a, it, she's a very disillusioning experience for her and she ends up killing herself because she can't deal with the fact that she can't be with her community. She can't be you know, around the people that she loves to, in, and at the same time help to make a livelihood for herself. And this film, Kieslowski, taught me about episodic work, how to make films that are episodic, which are things that feed into my work very directly. Decalogue is a 10-part mini film, basically, an hour per film, all about the Ten Commandments. And this one is about, um, well, it's called a short story about love, but really it's a short film about obsession and voyeurism and, and the more darker side of love. And it's basically about a man that's spying on this woman, a pretty promiscuous woman by, 
by the standards then, and he was in love with her, and he would basically stalk her, and then she flips a switch on him and starts to play with him, and it ends up disastrously, as it always does. And then this film, the last one I'm going to show you, is the film that actually made me want to make films. It's by Hong Kong director Wong Kar Wai in The Mood for Love. Um, when I watched this film, I knew this was what I needed to do. This is how I needed to express myself, or so I thought now in retrospect. Um, but In the Mood for Love is a film that is so atmospheric. The DOP is uh, Christopher Doyle, and they worked together for a very long time, Wong Kar Wai and Christopher Doyle. And the work they created together is some of the strongest work he's ever done. And it's about lost love, basically. These two couples, these two individuals, both have their own marriages, and their spouses are cheating on them with each other. This crazy kind of triangle. And they're trying to replicate, um, replicate what, their, what their spouses might be doing with each other because they're trying to understand why they would do that to them. So together, they kind of play out this scene, this, this love story that they imagine their spouses are having. And obviously, they can't fulfill their desire when, once it grows and becomes. They can't consummate it. It's a beautiful film, a beautiful score. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend you watch it. So after college, I started working for Spike Lee. That was a very short, short experience. And I realized then that Film wasn't actually for me. And not because I don't like the, the, the art form, it's because of the political aspects of film. It's the, it's the machismo of the film industry. Again, it's the feeling that you're constricted in a space and you can't uh, be yourself. Um, you have to always defer to someone else. And also, there was another side of it that I didn't really you know, anticipate when I was at a school level, at a, at, a, at a college level, when I was making films. It was the fact that it's such a collaborative, long-form process. And I kind of like instant gratification. I kind of like to go and make something and not have to rely on X, Y, Z people to make it happen. So I did a lot of things. And I was very worried. I was very worried. And my parents were even more worried because I've done theater and I've done film. And then I go and do design. They're like, what's wrong with you? And then I try photography. And they're like, seriously, you need to pick, go to business school. You know, just, can you just go to business school now? You've played around enough. And I even then didn't know why I was doing all these things and how they would ever marry, how they would ever merge. So when I was, after I had a design agency, that was a short blip, but I did, and I was working for all these clients, and, and inevitably it was very unsatisfying because even though it was my agency and I thought that would give me autonomy and I picked the clients I worked with, you're still fulfilling somebody else's idea. And what would always happen is that as you're going down the pipeline of you know, the bureaucratic kind of chain of command, the idea that you had that was here suddenly waters down to there. And it's, it was very disheartening. Maybe I was too precious. And maybe that is wrong. It is wrong, actually, to have to fulfill work for a client and be too precious about the work that you're doing. So I realized then, this is not for me again. And I kept on hitting these barriers. This is not for me. This is not for me. I had a friend who I hadn't seen for years who had just recently become a curator. And I was doing all these little graphic you know, works on the side just to kind of keep my creativity alive. It just was something I needed to do. It wasn't even necessarily to be shown. I would post it sometimes. I'd get people's feedback. But it wasn't in any way a career trajectory. I had no idea what I was doing it for. It was for my own satisfaction. She told me, she's like, you know what? How about you try and just maybe make a work and I'll put it in a show because it seems like you have very, a very clear aesthetic and idea around the work you're creating, but you need to expand. And so I made the first painting I ever made. And mind you, I'm, I hate this painting. Like, and that's how it should be, I think, after a while. You, you make things and you look back and you're like, that wasn't the best work, obviously, but it couldn't have been. It was the first step. I made a work that actually one of my friends from high school bought. <laughs> so. Um, this work was called Now and Forevermore. I really don't like the work, but I think that it's important to show it because this is part of the journey. And this is part of me figuring out what I wanted to say with my work, the kind of geometries I wanted to explore, the mathematics behind the work, the, the kind of macrocosm versus microcosmic conversations I was having around the work. 
This work um, showed in the Lower East Side in a gallery that no longer exists. And then I met an amazing young man who was the assistant to the artist Jim Hodges. If you're unfamiliar with Jim Hodges, this is his work, some of his work. He's uh, very prolific. But he did a series of works that were basically excavated boulders that he took from quarries in the New York area. Massive, massive boulders. And what he would do is he would metallicize one side of the boulder so that it, was, it married seamlessly with the other. So the organic rock would then become this organic metallic material in all colors, as you can see. And one of them he did in gold. And it was 24 karat gold. I went to the foundry, actually, and I saw the process the foundry that was in Beacon, New York. And I saw the process, and his assistant told me something. He said, you should maybe try using 24 karat gold. And I said, why would I do that? It's so expensive, why? And um, he's like, because people have an emotional reaction to gold. You cannot, you cannot replicate that with fool's gold, with gold paint, with 21 karat, 22 karat gold, or any other gold. Real gold, because of the, of the storied history of mankind with gold, is undeniable. And when people see it and people witness it, it is evocative. So it made me rethink my whole practice, which really wasn't a practice at the time, to be honest. But it was, it was me in my, my, my kitchen basically making these paintings. Um, but it made me rethink and it elevated my thought processes about the work. I am fascinated with gold. Um, I feel like I always have, I've always worn gold jewelry, I've always liked gold um, as a color, yellow gold predominantly, but I never really knew the kind of cosmic story of gold. And the reason why this is important is because in this modern society we live in, gold has been devalued, in my viewpoint, to a bartering tool, a monetary tool, a tool that is um, meant to just be a signifier of wealth, of luxury, kind of gaudy, um, and not really respected and revered in the way that it should be. I will speak more about the spiritual quotient of gold in, in the, in later on in this talk, but first I want to talk about the cosmic aspects of gold because most people do not know how gold is made. And if people knew how gold was made, they would marvel at why it is so scarce on this earth. Gold is made during a supernova, which is the death of a star. So as a star is dying, which basically means that it runs out of hydrogen, its core collapses on, each other, on itself, and it starts to implode, it's obviously a gas ball, so it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter as it implodes before it ricochets and all of these elements kind of get ricocheted into the universe. Um, so at every different heat signature, as the star is coming in on itself, imploding, a different element, all the elements in the universe are created during a supernova a different element and metal are created. One of the last things to be created in the supernova is gold. And gold is an immortal metal, and I mean that honestly, immortal. It does not rust, it does not tarnish, nothing can happen to it over time. I think only one very strong acid can in any way, uh, you know, basically tarnish gold. Gold can live forever. Gold. You can go to a church that was made in the Middle Ages that was gilded and it will still shine as bright as it does today if you clean it up a little bit. So gold is a very special metal to me for that reason. There's a, there's a um, British astrophysicist by the name of Brian Cox and he said that in all of human time, only 82,000 tons of gold has ever been mined and that's the equivalent of three Olympic-sized swimming pools of gold in all of time. So gold is a scarce, is a scarce uh, metal and, and uh, you know, material on this planet. I began to do research, you know, and looking into other artists because I, as an artist, as you will clearly see from the rest of these slides, I learned from other artists. I didn't go to art school. I didn't go to, I didn't have a traditional uh, education as a painter or a sculptor or any of these things. So how did I learn? I learned by reading voraciously, by watching voraciously, by listen, listening to artist talks and finding out about these great artists that I had never heard of before. And I learned about Constantine Brancusi, who says, complexity is simplicity resolved. And I started to look at works of Malevich as well, and, start, and suprematism, and learning about the idea that you can uh, abstract to such a point where it becomes a mathematical kind of object. 
And I took that idea and I ran with it because I was like, okay, I have now made the decision to use only gold in my works. And I want to have these conversations about, about philosophy and I want to have conversations about mathematics and these kind of universal languages, if you will. So I created uh, the first series of works in gold and they were called the Golden Ratio series. And as you can see, it literally is a Fibonacci sequence and some extra things added to it. Um, and basically, I made a triptych of these works. So each one had a third more gold. Everything to me is about math, breaking it down to um, you know, numbers, because I think numbers are the language of God. So these are the first works, Golden Ratio 1 and 2, and, and number 3 will be shown later. And then I created my first show. I had my first show in uh, a little Chelsea gallery in 2014, and I called this exhibition Arcadia. Arcadia is a Greek kind of mythical idea about a place, a, parad a paradise, if you will, where everything is ordered, there's complete balance, a very Greco kind of um, mythological kind of ideal, if you will. And I was starting to learn about the importance of space and how to use space to elicit feelings and to elicit starkness or coldness or warmth and all of this. But these are very cold works. They were very precise works. They almost looked like they weren't made by the human hand, and I meant them to be that. I wanted them to look like math objects, like objects that, um, that existed before man, if you will, or after man, whichever. So this is a series of works I created in 2014 for Arcadia. These are the works that are closer, a closer view. This is a very large work. It's 60, 64 by 80. And as you can see, it, pre it features Eve's Klein Blue. That was my, this was my proverbial blue period. It didn't last very long. Um, it'll come back though. And, <laughs> and um, I was very inspired by Eve's Klein. East Klein spoke about the same thing about gold, about the spiritual quotient of gold that's been lost on modern society. And, um, and obviously he has patented Klein Blue, but you can find Klein Blue or Majorelle Blue as it's called. Um, actually, if you go to uh, Morocco, you can go to Jardin Majorelle, which is, I think the last owner or occupant of it was, um, was a designer. I forget his name now. Very, Yves Saint Laurent, was it? And, um, and yes, it's, all, it's a blue house. So basically, what I'm saying is that Klein did not create the blue, but he patented the way to make that blue the way he uses it in his work. And I think that blue, as he described it, is like a void. That blue is like diving into an abyss. It's like the most abstract thing you can think of, like the sky. And that is why I fell in love with that blue. These are more images from the exhibition. I started to think about how to play with space, how to play with um, you know, visibility, create almost like a proverbial jewel box around the work so that it's a, you have to, you're peering into something, you're peering into a world. I wanted to create worlds through the work and through the ideas I was trying to express. These are more of the golden ratio works. This is number three, and this is the blue version of that work as well. This is a show I did at Miami Basel. I kind of continued the Arcadia idea. It was called Arcadia Into the Blue. And this is another work called Golden Age. This is all the works I made in 2014. And like I said, they were very, very precise works, very mathematical works, very um, kind of uh, constricted works. And the restricted palette was a limitation I placed on myself because I feel like in limitation, you have the absolute freedom to explore. When you limit the choices you have, it means that you can explore infinitely the ideas around those choices that you've made. This is where Vera comes in, because at this time, I'm sure you can tell, there were not very many like, you know, important shows on my resume, if you will. I was learning about the art world and how to, you know, um, you know, like how to play the proverbial game, if you will, but that didn't really matter to me. I just wanted to have my work there and show my work and continue to have the freedom I felt in making these works. And in 2015, Vera was the senior curator at the Cooper Gallery in Harvard, and she was putting on a show with Harvard Art Museums called The Art of Jazz, Form, Performance, and Notes. And Vera gave me my first serious institutional show. And 
she used the work from my 2014 series, Arcadia, which was in conversation with a lot of other amazing, amazing artists and was a very important milestone in, in my kind of trajectory. 2015, I decided that working in my kitchen would no longer suffice, especially making these kind of large-scale works. And so I got a studio. And I wanted my studio to be almost like Constantine Brancusi's studio, a place that reflects the ideology of my practice, the ideology of what I'm trying to imply with the work I'm making. This almost sense of, of almost perfection, if you will, because, because at that time, that was where my mind was at, and it has changed a lot since then, but at that time, I really wanted to create a space that was completely just um, spotless. Now, it doesn't make sense for a studio to be spotless. I learned that the hard way because now it's completely messy. But this was it when I first moved in, white as can be. I had a white room and I had a blue room. The blue room is literally like walking into a different frequency. And anyone that visits the studio will tell you that the white room is where I work, make my work and I you know, have my, all my works in, in production. And the blue room is kind of where I, I hold them where it's almost set up in a place where it's the right um, lighting to really be able to appreciate the gold, especially in the works. Because gold actually does not need any kind of spotlighting or harsh lighting. It needs low light conditions because it actually is a light source itself. So this is the blue room. This is my assistant at the time helping me gild the entire um, top, top uh, ceiling of the, of the space. And then I discovered black. <laughs> um, and for me, you know, black is the materia prima I was speaking about at the beginning of this talk. Black is um, the, the originator, the original source. You know, have you ever watched that show, The Universe, that Neil deGrasse Tyson did that was the, you know, the, the successor to the original universe by Carl Sagan? And it starts off in the beginning there was nothing and then bang which is how the universe apparently was created. And that nothingness is dark matter. That nothingness is, the only thing we can attribute to that is black. When you look into the night sky, it's black. You know, most of the universe is dark matter. So I began to start thinking about the importance of renegotiating our social constructs around this idea of black because it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, we have such a kind of terrible negative connotation when we think of black. I had this impulse, and I don't know what, what it was, and I still to this day don't know what it was, to blacken my face. And it wasn't about making black face. It wasn't a, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a kind of reference to that. Although black face is interesting because a lot of, um, of black people actually donned black face to kind of ridicule the uh, white Americans that were doing that to ridicule them in this kind of reverse you know, uh, conversation, if you will. But this wasn't about that. This wasn't about, about making fun of. This was about actually emboldening. And black to me was this way to embolden myself, to negate all of the social constructs and ideas that people have kind of driven into my skull about what it means to be black, or even just black in the universal sense of the word. Black is a value, is what I think it is. It's white and black are the, are the extremities of the color spectrum. They're the parents. And within that, all the other colors fall, fall, fall. Black is the full absorption of light, and white is the full negation of light. I started thinking about the importance of history, my history, West African history, African history, whatever you want to call it. Africa was carved up, but it wasn't carved up by us. And it was important that I began to kind of reintroduce um, myself to these narratives that were very uh, imbued in my, in my residual memory, if you will. So I started thinking about the figure, positioning. How do you create a, an image that allows you to, to uh, have, have power and control rather than the opposite? How do you take all the things that have been told to you are negative and make them all seem overpowering and positive? How do you be defiant in the face of, of all the things that would only break you down if they could? 
I started to create what I would call an alternative language in my work. This is another work I did um, in the same kind of vernacular called Yas and Tewa. Yas and Tewa was the, um, the Ghanaian um, princess, I believe, who basically won the, the Ashanti war against the British. And I assumed her character. And this is where performance starts to come in. This is where things start to make sense. This is where the photography and the design and the, and the filmic kind of perspectives and the idea of creating atmosphere and space and also the, um, the, the painting that I started to learn how to do, this is how it all began to make sense to me. These are the first works where I felt like I was hitting my stride. I want you guys to take a moment to read all the words that are attributed to black. And while you do that, I'm going to take some water. I think we can all agree that these are wholly negative things. And then you look at one of them, and the third one, it says, a word pertaining or belonging to any various populations characterized by dark skin pigmentation, specifically dark skinned peoples of Africa, Oceania, and Australia, African Americans. I started thinking about what is the psychological imperative, or what's the psychological impact of attributing yourself and calling yourself a word when these are the other signifiers and synonyms that are used and these are the other correlations that are made to this word. Again, how do I not combat that? It's nothing to combat because I don't think it's true. I think how do you renegotiate it? How do you renegotiate the conversations around blackness? These are some more of the synonyms. I'll pick some out. Treacherous, sooty, inky, villainous, fiendish, devilish, monstrous. So I decided to do the whole thing. Instead of just make, making my face black, I decided to blacken my entire body. And these were the precursor to Materia Prima uh, and all of the works that have kind of come since. These were prototypes, these were early photographs that um, I was basically mulling over these ideas I was just talking about and how to stand in defiance of those ideas, how to make it something you must look at and recognize its beauty. These are more prototypes and more of the kind of initial images I was playing around with. And of course, gold features. Gold is the, is the light in the darkness, although darkness is not a negative. It's, darkness is required for there to be light. They cannot exist without each other. It's a dualistic universe we live in. This is the first Materia Prima. And I was really trying to play with, you know, the, the, the color palette really did dwindle even more and diminish even more because I really wanted to get to this idea of essentialism. What is the essential conversation I'm having? Going back to that Brancusi, complexity is simplicity resolved. I'm oh, sorry, simplicity is complexity resolved. Um, how do you make a statement and make it as simple or use the least amount of materials as possible and still make it as, as impactful as possible. Materia prima, this idea of primitive or primordial or the source of it all, the mother, if you will, um, this was that work that, that, that basically spawned the rest of the works I'm going to show you. And I wanted people to be able to have alternative readings about things they thought they knew about. Alternative readings about things that, um, that we've been taught that I knew deep inside were not right. And they were fulfilling an agenda, but it wasn't my agenda, and it wasn't helping me at all. I started to, again, always go back to other artists. When I start to make a new investigation, I actually look at my peers or those that have come before me um, to kind of make sense of my journey too. I learned from them. And I started to introduce myself to the work of Louise Nevelson. I saw her work for the first time, I believe, um, in Boston. And since then, I've seen her work many times. I've watched countless documentaries. She was a hell of a woman. And um, 
all these works are made, if you don't know who Louise Nevelson is, all these works are made with found objects. And what she would do is that she would compose these amazing sculptures. Talk about layers and volumes and abstractions and, and these beautiful works. And then she would color them monochromatic, one color, black, usually black. She does works in white and works in gold too, but usually black. Louise Nevelson has said, I fell in love with black. It contained all color. It wasn't a negation of color, it was an acceptance. Because black encompasses all colors. Black is the most aristocratic color of all. You can be quiet and it contains the whole thing. And that's Louise Nevelson, I love her. I learned about Pierre Soulage, who's still going, and I love, I love his practice. Because when you look at the, the, the way that he molds black, you begin to see all the different hues and the, refract, and the refractiveness and the, and the reflective aspects that you can have when you do matte and gloss, all the different hues. If you play with black, you know, Carrie James Marshall talks about the difference between Mars black and, and carbon black um, and bone black. Bone is a, is a cool temperature. Mars is a, is, a, is a warm red black. Carbon is a neutral black. These blacks, when put together, have different um, hues that you can actually perceivably see, which you wouldn't be able to see when they're separate. Pierre Soulage is a titan to me in terms of his ability to, to play with the finishes of black. The, the, the ability to make marks in this way. I learned about Alberto Buri and texture and material, the use of what I would call like fractal patterns, which I'll get into. Um, I started seeing that in his work, the scale, the scale. I started learning about Aboriginal dream paintings or dot paintings and how they're made, which are very similar to how most African textiles are dyed and made too, which is flat. They're made flat and you work downwards. Most artists, I won't say most, a lot of artists work you know, up towards the work and these works are all made down to the floor, down to the ground. And they are constellations in themselves. I started learning about the different golds of, of the Akan culture, the, uh, Ivory Coast gold and Ghanaian gold, the, the kind of importance of adornment in those cultures, how gold is a spiritual and a... Um, a conduit for them, again, like I said, a conduit to speak to the higher, the higher dimensions and not actually just luxury tools, not just tools to, 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 to demarcate wealth. I started learning about fractals. My mentor at the time, a future speaker here, David Ajay, he introduced me to Ron Eglash, and who I just learned is a new um, professor here. And that's amazing. You guys are very lucky. And I started learning about fractals and, and about the fact that they grow organically in many um, architectural practices in, on the continent. They're also what you will see when you see uh, cornrows or braids. I'm not going to speak too much on this because I told Christina earlier that if Ron English is sitting in this audience, I don't want to do him any justices. So I'm not going to say any more. And then I created this work called Constellations One. And this is a very large-scale work. It's the only in the series, the only figurative work. It was, again, kind of a test, but not really. Everything is a test, really. But I started to marry all those things I was looking at, um, all the things I was speaking about in the works. This is Constellations 2 and Constellations 3. Um, there's a little bit of, of a furor going on right now. I bring it up because it's important, I think, to clarify. Um, these works were used in the All the Stars video um, for the Black Panther uh, title track by Kendrick Lamar and SZA. And they were used without my permission. And a lot of people say, oh, well, firstly, why wouldn't you say yes? That's my business, but it's because I wasn't interested, firstly, um, in participating, and I didn't feel like, like the film would take into consideration all of the nuances of these cultures that, um, that were being referenced to. 
And I didn't want my work to be used in that way because my work to me is very spiritual and it's very um, much imbued in idea of, of elevating the realities of my Africanness in the world and, and projecting this, this other narrative that I think is, is not to be shared in that way. It's to be shared with people that want to tune in, but not en masse, not broadcast it. And so I bring that up because what I hear a lot is, oh, but these are just African textiles. You don't own black and gold. No, I don't own black and gold. Um, these are just you know, symbols that have been taken from other places. No, they're not. And it really requires people to inform themselves about the realities of, of the, the processes I've gone through to get to this point to have the respect that is demanded and should be demanded of every artist in their practice and in their craft from getting to a point A to B. These works feature a lot of symbols that are in circulation, a lot of symbols that are used by societies and cultures all over the world because I believe in the idea of marrying, the idea of, of synthesizing things that may seem diverse and divergent. But really, all of them are actually my own because they're all changed and they're all transposed. These are the, this is me um, in the studio making these works. Like I said, they're very large scale works. And the process is very long. It takes about four, four to five months to make each one. And um, I would say these are the most significant works in my short, short career <laughs> um, that I've made because they actually began to speak truly about what, where my mind was at, what I wanted to have a conversation about, what I wanted to imbue. And I was actually getting more interested in abstraction than I was in figuration. This is Constellations 4, and I show this because I want to, people to get a sense of the dimensionality of the surfaces of the work, the reliefs of the work, because they are not flat works. They are works that are molded and sculptured, sculpted onto the canvas, so they actually rise off the canvas. This is my studio this week, actually. I took this picture so that um, you can see kind of the process, and it's a slow process. That was a whole week of work over there. Um, and also just the kind of schematic that's going on, the, the, the images that are in the studio right now, these were actually images I was using when I was, or looking to my mood board, if you will, when I was making the works for New Orleans, which I'll talk about shortly. This is um, the, the show I did at Spelman. Uh, it was a group show called Africa Forecast, Fashion and Contemporary Life. And I knew that I wanted to kind of create this kind of um, temple, if you will, or, or this... Uh, um, place where it felt like it was for ritual, for, for, uh, for worship. And it wasn't about worshiping self because these are not self-portraits. When I use my body, for me, it is a completely, um, it's me kind of being an archetype. A high, a, a, and and the, the dualism of the feminine and the masculine are what, it's always at play in my work. So even though the, the body is feminine, I feel that something supremely masculine in the stats and the positionality of the work. So for me, they're imbued with all principles. This is the show that I did later on with Vera as well, at the Woven, called The Woven Arc at the Cooper Gallery. And this is where the works featured as well. And then I began to make an investigation into, again, playing with black, but I wanted to have a little bit more of a narrative going. So I started the Dark Continent series, which is um, kind of a play on 19th century ideology of the dark continent, which was a word that people actually to this day still kind of use, very um, derogatory, and basically this idea that Africa was a dark place, lacking civility, um, a bunch of ruffians and savages who needed to be civilized, and uneducated, so on and so forth. It was basically playing up with the colonial agenda. And there were these European kind of adventurers and explorers going into the deep dark jungle to basically um, civilize these people, these Africans. And I wanted to make a series of works that kind of played with that story. Because again, the idea of primitivism, I'm very into etymology. And primitivism, or being primitive, has again a very negative connotation in our society. But I believe that primitive, if you actually look at it, comes from the word prime, 
which comes from the word source. So to be primitive to me is not, a, is not an insult at all, actually. It means that you are one with the idea of the materia prima, the source. These are the ethnographic images that were kind of being circulated during the colonial project, um, always showing again these uncivilized, kind of bare-breasted, naked women, and tribal, the tribalism, um, the savagery, if you will. And without taking into any consideration the significance of why people dress like this, and, and just actually putting it in a placement, in a position where it was just meant to be viewed as you are less than, you are subhuman, you need to be um, you know, lifted by our you know, perspectives, our European perspectives. I was also looking at form. So I was looking, and this may seem very disparate to you, I, I'm sure it does, but I was looking at form when I was making this work. So I was looking at the work of Pina Bausch and the way she used her body and positioned her body. I was looking at Martha Graham and the way she positions her body. Um, and I started creating these series of works. And very black works, but again, playing with that idea of playing with different tonalities of black and blackening the body and being in a black world within the body and, and, and kind of tongue-in-cheek poking at that idea of the dark continent. Am I being complicit or am I, am I debunking it? Am I poking fun at it? Like, I want, I want it to have all those questions imbued in it. I want it to be a bit subversive. So these are, at this point, it's a series of 25 works and they're gonna be expanded next year for a show I'm doing um, in London. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because I know time's ticking. This last work is, um, actually all these works are very small. They're actually the smallest works I've ever made and I made them small purposefully so they, they force engagement. They're very small, like 8.5 by 10 works. Um, and and for this one, which is showing next week in Miami, I, I made it much bigger because I actually wanted to ex expand the, the visual field, let people see the details in, in a much kind of larger scope. So this work is actually 42 by 52, much larger version of it. Um, and like I said, this series will be continuing next year and for years to come, I don't know, because I just feel like you need to um, explore until the well runs dry, if you will. And then, I, with the same idea of the black I was speaking about before, I created this show in London last year called Black Exodus. And I blacked the entire space out. It was almost like going into a cave. It was cavernous, because you had to go downstairs into the gallery. And then there was no external light, no, no outside, no daylight. And so you really had this kind of meditative, um, quiet space. Again, the frequency changed in the, in the room. It was like a... Like a, like a uh, just a, a, like a low frequency buzz in the room, you know? And, and, and because it was so far out of the way, the gallery, people went there one at a time. They could have time with the work and really experience the work one on one in an intimate way. I was looking when I made those works, when I made that room, um, I was looking at, I'm a big fan, I'm a big student of architecture, and I was looking at, um, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with Rothko's Chapel, because in short, Rothko's Chapel is a space made to, in, to, to house works, rather than, a, rather than a space where works are placed. And that's a very novel idea, which most artists don't ever get to experience, is when you actually have an architecture that actually supports the work, rather than you just hanging works on a wall. That is my dream in, in every capacity, is to basically work to, in tandem with the space always, so that the tensions and the releases are always um, present, and they are the decisions of the artists. I was looking at the upper room by Chris Ophelia that was at Tate, and how he did this kind of disciple-ish almost, the 12 disciples with these Reese Monkey paintings he did, um, and again, this idea of coming into a very kind of uh, a space that was very considered for, to elicit a certain experience in the viewer. I created these works for the first time, which were these kind of translucent works, 
um, the canvas is transparent. So you can see through it, you can see to the frame, and the frame for this one obviously was the Union Jack. And uh, it, was a, it was like working almost like you had a canvas like glass, if you will. Um, and gilding on that was a very different experience than gilding on canvas or gilding on paper. This is how the frame was constructed, basically. It's all wood, and I, I did it with the idea of, of having a stretcher, but having the stretcher not just being a support device, but also an integral part of the work, a window into the work. And this is the first kind of mock-up or kind of prototype for what was the frame that was used in that, in that work. And then I expanded it. And the whole thing was based on this image, which is from a 1906 uh, book from Liberia. This is like, a, like early kind of, you know, pre-settler Liberian fisherman nets. And I used this prototype to expand and extrapolate and create a kind of continuous pattern, which became what was the, the, um, the jewel box, if you will, that was created when I showed at Armory this year. And these are the early prototypes. This is the 3D rendering of the space. And it was this idea of, of removing the walls and creating a, a, a hyper-visual space but you had that was almost like you're peering into something. It was also looking at the Mashrabiya kind of ar 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 Arabic architectural tradition, um, which basically is the veil. There's a veil to these works. To enter into it, you must enter with, this, with the right kind of um, uh, energy. I was looking at, you know, great architects like Tatadao Ando. Um, this is the Chichu Art Museum. This is the Church of Light that he's done. These are the kind of things I'm looking at when I'm thinking about how to make space evocative, how to make space an extension. I was looking at Carlo Scarpa. I was looking at African modernist works um, and, and buildings um, in terms of the kind of shapes that could be uh, used in the kind of veils that could be used, as you can see there, like the same kind of, you know, peer through, you can see in, you can see out type of perforated walls. And this is what came out of it, the black art. And the whole space was black. Um, and then, and this is Materia Prima too. And these are the other works. This is Constellations 5 and 6. These are all in view in Armory. And then I took the same thing and it's a modular kind of panels and I, and I made a whole new shape when I showed it Manifesto this year. Um, the same black arc with Constellations 5, but a different kind of read because it's on white now and, and so you can really see this idea of these nets, like this work is being kind of held in these nets. And then the last, and I have a very short period of time, I know, is this recent show. It's open right now at New Orleans Museum of Art. And it's all about the founding of Liberia. Um, I use this character called the Libyan Sibyl, uh, who was this uh, uh, goddess character in Greek kind of mythology. And she was the foreseer of, of ill-fated futures. And because Liberia has such a um, fraught history, it was important that there was a figure that could tell these stories. Um, and in these works, they feature, this is the other view, sorry, of the installation. And in these works, they feature the Liberian flag, which is basically the American flag with one star. So basically, all the iconography of Liberia is American, and that's what I wanted to really show in these works. I wanted to show this passage from America to Liberia, and they, they were Americans that basically founded Liberia. And I wanted to, um, to, to unveil, lift the veil of that history because it's one that's so, so um, underdocumented, so not spoken about. This is in the studio as the works are being made. And these are more of the works that are in that exhibition. Um, all of them employing kind of African textile motifs that are actually Europeanized. Blisco patterns, if you will, the kind of loss of, 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 loss of um, ownership over your own conversations, which is what happened in Liberia. These images, a lot of them are actually taken directly from the framework of the image, are taken directly from um, 
these early books, because there are very few books on the early settlers of Liberia, these early books that were basically tracking um, the, 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 the settlers as they went and the kind of developments that were being made architecturally, um, with, with agriculture, how people were settling in into these spaces. And this, this actually comes from an image of a woman who was dressed in the exact same way, but different, obviously, textile, in standing in this architecture that looked, didn't look African, West African, looked very um, much like the antebellum South, because that's the architecture that was transposed to Liberia. Sorry. And then I also imposed maps because these maps are the way of us recording history. We record history through the, the, the way that we have kind of partitioned and divided areas of the world. And these maps were not drawn by, by, by us, they were drawn by others. This was a map of all the tribal cultures that were basically um, in the area before the main kind of migration happened. A lot of them are gone now. This map is an early map of the coast Liberia. And this is the detail of that work. I want to close, I have about a minute left. Um, I want to close with this idea or this quote from Marina Abramovich. Uh, she gave to young artists, advice she gave to young artists. And she said, a good artist will probably have one great idea throughout his life, while a great artist will have two at the very most. And I do believe this. I do believe that most artists are always regurgitating and replaying and renegotiating the same conversations over and over again, even if they look completely different. The bodies of work look completely different. And coming back to this idea of materia prima, that is always what I'm searching for, is the idea of coming back to source, the idea of coming back to unveiling hidden um, realities and truths that we have shrouded over time because it didn't fit our agenda for whatever reason. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you for coming out today. Um, I will be going to the screening room, and I'd be happy to take any further questions there. I want to say thank you very much for your attention.